So welcome everyone to our Coding with uh, the JV Invent Team Activity Guides webinar. I'm Stephanie Couch. Next slide. And joining me uh, today are Lee Estabrooks, the Invention Education Officer from the Limelson MIT program, uh, of which I'm the Executive Director. We also have An Mei Chung, who'll be uh, joining us from CS for All. And then George Kirkman, who you're going to hear um, from a little bit later, who is a Limelson MIT Invent Team facilitator, as well as an educator, and uh, what he calls a robot doctor with rolling robots. So I'm sure you're going to enjoy uh, hearing from George. Next slide. The Lumelson MIT program is funded by the Lumelson Foundation and it's administered uh, by the School of Engineering here at MIT. We've been working for 15 years with educators and student teams developing ways of thinking and the skills that are needed for young people to invent solutions to problems that they find and then work to solve uh, from their local communities. One of the reasons we're so interested in coding, uh, next slide please, is that as we've done our research, um, we've realized how important the work in this team-based approach is at the high school level for young women and students who are underrepresented in STEM because they really do want to work as problem solvers. They want to make meaningful contributions um, in their local communities and they're willing to um, learn technologies and uh, STEM subjects that perhaps have not been uh, something that they've participated in the past if it means that that is a way to come up with something that is going to help people and solve real world complex problems in their backyard. And one of the things that we've seen are real struggles is some of the technical skills uh, relating to coding and other types of technologies that the learning opportunities have not been afforded to them early on. And so we see this wonderful opportunity in California with the Kids Code Initiative to um, provide some of those necessary background skills earlier on in young people's lives, um, but also believe that to attract young women uh, and students from underrepresented backgrounds that we really need to think about the coding as coding for our purpose. And we realize um, that we have some resources that we can bring to the table in that regard, as well as our history uh, in, in this space. Um, and you can read more about that here. Uh, we've provided the links to some of the research we've been doing. And also the last link is to a wonderful piece that just came out, um, uh, created in part by a wonderful educator, Deep History in California, Linda Kakelis. And um, it speaks to the real importance of thinking about parents as we go about this work and ways they can be involved. And um, uh, hopefully at the end of this webinar and Q&A, Q um, we'll get some insights into that from Linda. I believe she's, she's on today. Um, so the challenges uh, that, that we believe exist for after school programs have been confirmed as well by our colleague in May at on May at CS for All, um, which made us highly aware of the need for high quality uh, resources to support after school educators. And um, that's again where we hooked up because we believe we have some of those that can help and, and CS for All does as well. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Lee and she's going to share a little bit more about the resources we have that are free that we think can be helpful. Hi, good afternoon everyone. How are you? Uh, my name is Lee and I'm the Invention Education Officer here at the Limelson MIT program. And I'm pleased to share with you some of our free resources that we have for teachers and students, specifically with our JV Invent Team Activity Guides. Uh, you'll see on the slide here that uh, there's a link to uh, these activity guides. And we have eight different activity guides 
Uh, these are based on different themes, if you will. Um, and uh, you, you're going to hear from George here in a few minutes about a couple of the activity guides that he's actually used and added coding and uh, computers into these. Um, these activity guides have been used in after school uh, settings for about five years now and uh, we've been pleased that George has uh, utilized them in, in his program out there in the after school uh, uh, settings in California. Next please. Uh, this is an example of what the JV Invent Team guide pages look like. Uh, this is um, a page from Electronic Textiles. As you can see this was meeting four um, but in, in each of our uh, meetings, we want the students uh, to think about uh, what's in their inventor's toolkit. And uh, here with electronic textiles, uh, we do teach some basic circuitry, but George will tell you in a few minutes um, about how he's extended this uh, JV Invent Team Guide to include much more computing and coding. Next, please. And uh, so uh, George, I, I, I've, I've been staring at you for a few minutes here. It's great to see you and it's also great to see your Invent Team sign behind you. George is an Invent Team facilitator this year with Rolling Robotics Outreach Invent Team. He's in Rolling Hills Estate and uh, George has done a great job over the past, I guess we've, what, three years now, George, that we've worked with you? Um, first with a professional development and then with a junior varsity invent teams or JV invent teams and now with the invent team initiative. So George is going to tell you about some of the things that he's done to incorporate more coding, uh, uh, more computer activities in these guides and not only what he's done but why he's added these components. So with that George I'm going to let you take it away. Yeah, I think I'll stick back on that previous slide because that's a, that's a good introduction to, uh, I have uh, about three, t three things I'd kind of like to accomplish today. One is kind of tell you my path of how I went from, you know, not knowing much to uh, Lemelson MIT Invent team. Um, give you some uh, background on Arduino and hopefully give you a bunch of resources that you can use to, to get started. Um, and, and then talk about how I incorporated that into some of the, the JV Invent team uh, modules. And also maybe how I've expanded uh, my program here to include even uh, younger students. Uh, I've been uh, poking around with Lemos and MIT for about four years, I guess it is and three summers. I, I came to know this because my daughter was in a school that was um, proposing an invent team grant. And uh, unfortunately, they didn't get it that year. And then I found the JV invent teams and said, oh, well, this is something we can do anyway without an invent team grant and started picking that up. And I guess it was two summers ago, I did the professional development uh, in Southern California at Irvine, which I guess is just coming up again this summer in July. And that introduced me to it. Uh, and also uh, one nice thing happened there, there was a raffle and I won a making noise resources kit. <laughs> and so I already had the beginnings of getting started with my JV Invent team from that uh, program. And I got together a group of kids and that's what uh, this picture on your, I guess the left side here is this team working as a JV invent team, uh, which then we went on to write a proposal for Excite Award, which we received. And the next summer then I went to MIT to experience Eureka Fest and get further trained as an invent team leader. And then my students that you see on the right uh, worked extremely hard over the summer, including a marathon through Labor Day weekend, where I, I think they worked 72 hours in four days or something like that, 80 hours in four days, probably. Um, and we got the Invent Team Award. And where we are now is we're in the home stretch, uh, finishing that up and preparing for Eureka Fest. 
as well as these students getting through AP Week here. So these kids are, are busy. Okay, I guess uh, next. Um, so I wanted to introduce uh, Arduino, and I recognize there's all levels of uh, people out there that may know a lot about computers, may know a little, uh, some programs that may have a lot of money to spend on stuff and other programs that have just a few dollars to spend on stuff. And I think Arduino is a great uh, platform for kind of all of those different levels to, uh, to use. And so the Arduino Uno, the blue board shown here is kind of the workhorse of Arduino that I use. Um, it's, uh, and you know, even if I go back one step, you know, Arduino is basically a microcontroller, which means it's a small computer, so we can make it do dedicated things. But uh, just like your laptop, it has a processor in it and it has inputs and outputs and it can, it can do logic and it does a lot of stuff. Some people know it as very limited, but you can go pretty deep with it. Uh, also, it's open source, so uh, it can be very low cost, cost. So there's many different people making these boards. I just showed one here that I like to use, and I think you can pick these up for about $12 or, you know, maybe in a pack of 10, they're only about eight bucks or so, which is a nice, nice place to start. Uh, and then the lily pad is a specialized one, which is made for being sewed into fabrics. And so that one uh, fits nicely into the electronic textiles. We can make kind of computerized gloves and bags and scarves and thing, things like that. Uh, let's move to the next. Uh, the other nice thing about it is all of the software tools you need are free. And so for any, uh, you know, any coding environment, you need some kind of editor or what we call an IDE, an integrated development environment, where not only is it an editor, it, it helps you with compiling and helps you with errors and also is set up to be able to upload to your microcontroller board. Uh, Arduino has a simple one that's easy to use. And like I said, it's free, you download it. I, I gave the link here. And then the next slide is even better. Uh, I put new in quotes because this is absolutely new to me, but I think it may have been around for about two years now. Uh, a browser-based IDE for Arduino, uh, which is all done in your browser. So like if you're using Chromebooks or something, uh, it's usable there. Uh, also, the nice thing about it is then all of your programs that you write are stored in cloud. So if a student wants to access this from home, uh, they can get it. Or if they come in on different days in the workshop and you're sharing computers or something, uh, they can all have their own uh, storage area on the cloud and they can get to it. They don't have to run around trying to remember which computer they used last week, which has been kind of a, a problem in, in my space, my area here. Um, Okay, that's good. Uh, I think a lot of students learn Scratch. Uh, this is I, my attempt at trying to show that Scratch can translate to Arduino very easily. I'll, I'll go to the right side first about Arduino that uh, every Arduino, the Arduino language is, has a C structure to it. So if you know C language, things like if then else, while loops, for loops, how we deal with variables and things are all common. And then within Arduino, there are some things, you know, particular to the microcontroller that are unique. Uh, and Scratch also has kind of a, a C structure to it too, that if you learn Scratch, you can make the leap to C, uh, you know, relatively easily. And so on the right, uh, every Arduino program has to have at least two parts to it, a, uh, a setup and a loop. And the setup is, just like it says, it sets up things. And the loop is where your main code is that loops and runs over and over. And then there are there can be different, different areas also. But I tried to kind of show the same thing on Scratch here that uh, clicking a flag in Scratch. So if you're not familiar with Scratch, Scratch is um, 
developed by MIT and it's a graphical language that is very easy to make things like animations and games and uh, those types of things, things that are visual on the screen. So it's all done on the screen. You don't need any external hardware like an Ar Arduino would need. And it's all done with colorful blocks like this, but the structure is very real. It's not like a colorful toy. Uh, it's a very real place to learn, learn code. And I, I take all my students through this at some point. So on the scratch side, uh, clicking a flag is maybe like pushing the reset button on the Arduino. And then the first part is maybe setting up. What this does is it takes a little sprite and kind of shows it and hides it. So maybe we might first set the size of the sprite to a particular size, 60% here, hide it, and then in a forever loop, show, wait a second, hide it, wait another second, and then it loops back and does this over and over. Uh, on the Arduino side, what this is, is this is code for blinking a light. And so similarly in the setup, we might say, okay, we have an LED that we're gonna use as an output. And then in the loop, the way to turn it on is this command digital write. We tell it to be high. Delay is waiting a second. And then digital write is low, turning it off, and then waiting a second. So you can see that the C, that the Arduino structure and the scratch structure, you can make that translation. And it's been very easy for me teaching kids to say, oh yeah, here's this loop. Remember forever loop? Uh, that's just what this is. Uh, Okay, so let's go to next. So what extends with Arduino is you can have uh, all types of sensors and devices connecting to this Arduino. And there's different routes you can go. Uh, one picture I show here is this uh, super kit that costs about $35 and includes most anything you would need to do lots of different projects. Uh, but you don't need all that. Um, you could just build your own kit if you can, you know, if you know where to look for things. So like one of the simplest sensors is a push button, uh, gives you, enables you to interact with um, the Arduino. And a simple push button, you know, is, is pennies basically. And then the simplest output is an LED. And again, those are, you know, 10 cents or a pack of a bunch of them for a few dollars. Uh, one of the ones we use in frequently in one of the JV Invent teams is temperature sensor. And even that is, uh, we'll show a little later, it's a, a simple little sensor. Uh, relays, servo motors, stepper motors, and then maybe a little more advanced is trying to use a screen to, to give a little more uh, output information. Uh, next. And then the lily pad has its own assortment of things. Uh, so in the electronic textiles activity, we use the sewable conductive thread and we use LEDs, we use switches, uh, we use battery sources. Uh, but for the most part, you're limited then to, you know, having something nice that lights up kind of, maybe there's a few more advanced things you can do, but it's uh, basically having some nice thing that lights up. If we add an Arduino to it, the lily pad Arduino, then we can start to use things like the light sensor where maybe if you open up a bag, a light turns on inside the bag or some example uh, like that. Uh, the other one is an accelerometer. We use an accelerometer to make, uh, we made kind of an Iron Man glove that when you opened your hand, it lit up in inside your, your hand and that was all done with the accelerometer knowing that you had moved your fingers and opened your hand. Uh, let's go next. Uh, this is some details and here this is a shows another tool that you can get for free, uh, Fritzing, which is a circuit, uh, graphical circuit design tool uh, that can draw schematics of circuits and then output them in uh, graphics like this that you know, look like uh, real circuits. And as far as, you know, from a computer science side of things, we're, we're learning how, how computers work here. So we're using digital outputs, digital inputs, 
a serial output to uh, output to the computer screen, uh, analog input. So even just going through with the students and learning, what, what does this word digital and analog mean? And the simple quizzes of, you know, which sensor is digital and which sensor is analog, going through that. Uh, then they would use uh, logic, make calculations, and um, so forth. Uh, next, let's see. And then, so then going a little more uh, deep is a temperature sensor. And this is, uh, this is an analog. Uh, it gives an analog output that's proportional to temperature. It's something you can buy a pack of, you know, four or five of them for four or five bucks. Um, and the one thing that I've uh, used this a lot for that we see the kids learn is how to take some data from a sensor and then create an equation to then uh, fill in different points. So this device is relatively linear, but for a student to take you know, a couple data points and develop what is the equation of the line that this sensor fits with is uh, great learning. And in the computer, this runs into issues of learning how to do math with integers and decimal numbers. And they fall into a lot of traps that are kind of difficult. So it's, it's, a, it's a great learning thing. It seems like it's just, hey, a little thermometer measuring temperature, but there's a lot behind it to, to make it work. Uh, next. And then kind of uh, more advanced is an LCD display. Uh, one of the nice things about the LCD display is there's a library of somebody wrote a lot of code to be able to display different things on different lines. And so that's another, you know, computer science learning aspect of using libraries. You don't have to write all of your own code. It's not practical. Why would I write code to run an LCD when I'm busy writing code to to do something else. If somebody else has done it, uh, let's use that. And so they learn, you know, a bit about how an LCD works, about data transfer. And then if we get advanced enough, uh, we actually solder up the circuits. So most of the circuits are all done on these breadboards and uh, wires fall out and you come back the next week and they're, they're not working. So if we can move the students to learning how to solder and soldering it up onto a little board, it, it it helps a lot. Uh, let's see what's next. And then further on, like if to store data, uh, there are cards that do um, SD card data storage. And I think my next one is code, but let's see next. Oh no, no oh good, this is the right next one. I think after that, I, I, I have a slide with a bunch of code that we used, but it may be more than we want to talk about, but I will show it. So now I kind of guess I want to get into what I was really supposed to talk about, how I integrate this with uh, JV and Venn teams. Uh, so two of the units that I love are chill out and electronic textiles. Uh, when I teach inventing, and I, I think this is really kind of principle of JV invent teams, uh, we're, we're trying to give them a toolbox of tools that they can use to invent. And I think when students ask me, you know, how to learn to invent, I think I quote Lee and say, st by starting to invent. If we want to learn to invent, the best way to learn is starting to invent. Uh, but maybe before you can really be practical with that, you need to have a toolbox. And uh, I throw out another quote, I guess Thomas Edison said to, to invent you need a, a good imagination and a pile of junk. And so you might see I have a pile of junk behind me here. My, my rooms are pretty messy. Uh, but with a, a good imagination, a pile of junk, maybe you can invent something. I like to add to that, you need a good toolbox. You have to have a lot of good stuff in your toolbox. So when we do something like, for example, the shoe soles lesson uh, in which we try to design a better sole for a shoe based on biomimicry, maybe we're going to make a footprint that looks more like an animal might have or something. Uh, we don't all go off to be shoe inventors, but through that, we all learned how to do casting and molding of silicone and rubber. And, and now the students have this new tool uh, that they can use in many different places. So uh, 
the like I said, the first module I got was kind of given to me. So I jumped into the making noise module and I, I loved it because it has lots of aspects of learning in that we we do elect electrical circuits, the kids learn about switches and wires and things and they learn about magnets and then they learn about uh, electricity and its interactions with magnets or maybe this thing we call electromagnetism. We build a speaker and you know maybe they never knew what was inside these speakers that they use all the time. Uh, and so that, that was a great learning one. So I wanted to pick another one that I thought would have a lot of that basic learning in it. And the, the chill out one is, is a really good um, lesson that, you know, we learn, you know, we're learning thermodynamics, but to put it more simply, we learn how things get hot and how things get cold, how we move heat from one object to another. I really like the penguin aspect. We, we think about how penguins keep themselves warm and learn about things. And then we do an exercise pot and pot cooler where we learn how to keep things cold if you're in the hot desert. And I kind of cap my program off with making a refrigerated lunchbox that now I'm working with a group of kids and making it computer controlled. So the Arduino is very good at taking inputs and then uh, doing some logic and making outputs. And so to the refrigerated lunchbox, we add a temperature sensor and we use the Peltier cooler, but controlled by an electronic relay. So we can measure the temperature and either turn the relay on or turn it off depending on the set point where we want the temperature to be. And the kids can go as deep as they want, or they can kind of just start out and see how it works. Uh, but if they want to, they can make fairly complicated uh, control systems to, to use with that. Um, I, uh, I think I already talked a little bit about the uh, electronic textiles. That one, the, the Arduino fits right into it as a nice extension. Uh, you know, I mentioned that you can have a light sensor or an accelerometer. And again, it's, it's fairly simple logic that the light sensor, either it sees light or it doesn't. And then you make some logic decision based on that. So it could be a thing that like, if somebody opens your bag, an alarm goes off or for convenience, if you open your bag, a light goes on inside or, or something. Uh, so that, that's kind of nice and kind of gives them another tool of invention. Um, An accelerometer, you know, you, you could, uh, accelerometer basically measures acceleration. So when something moves, it knows. It, it also measures tilt. So like in your iPhone, when you tilt it around, uh, the, it's an accelerometer that's knowing which way it's tilted. So you could think of, you know, all kind of things like a, a theft device that if your bag gets picked up, you'd know, or if, if your coffee cup tips over, maybe it seals up or something, things, things of that nature. Uh, let me go to the next one. This one is here in case anybody really wants to look at the code. Uh, I realized when I put this together, I was very hardware heavy. And I think that was the right thing to do because now you all can find these resources and get started with hardware. Uh, if you really need code, there's a lot of resources out there to help you. But this is an example of our control system for our refrigerator. And I, I think that's my last one. And I think I'll have a lot to say when we talk about questions. Oh, this is just some links to some resources. So I do have a web page that is kind of like my notebook of various things. I think it asks you to give me your email and stuff, and then you can browse around on various lessons I do. And then there's Arduino, and then there's places for, for buying all of these little pieces I talked about. So um, again, as we saw this wonderful work happening in California, we asked ourselves, how can we support it here at the Lomelson MIT program? 
And, um, you know, we're a small staff. We're trying to do run a lot of initiatives, but um, we know you have a regional structure. If there's an ability to participate in a meeting within a region, um, we, we'd be happy to do that. Um, we, if there are specific topics that we can pull people together and present on um, that would address a major need, we'd, we'd be happy to um, consider hosting additional webinars. Uh, we are having a professional development uh, session in California and one at MIT. I apologize, it is a fee-for-service workshop um, because we, uh, that's how we sustain staff to do projects that, that aren't specific to what our funder uh, has asked us to do. Um, and then we also um, created an opportunity for what we're calling Partners in Invention, which would be a membership-driven um, professional learn learning community across the year. And we tried to chunk the learning community up into uh, age spans that, that are um, make sense from the resources we have to offer. One is K-5, one is six through 10, and one is 11, 12. Um, there's details in the, the link to the brochure about what the focus will be of that those learning communities, and that will be in-depth year-round support, um, hopefully with three educators per membership. Um, but we're trying to do what we can because we know a lot of people don't have resources, so we're trying to do what we can uh, also just on a volunteer basis. And, and hopefully uh, there was something that will be of value uh, from today's webinar. Um, the folks who will be with us in the, the learning community and uh, professional development session include some of the original um, developers of Scratch and Scratch Junior and Pico Crickets. Um, they're part of uh, the group that works with Mitch Resnick at the Media Lab here at MIT and uh, Lifelong Kindergarten uh, group. And, um, you know, they, they look forward to being able, along with us, to support any particular initiatives that after school uh, programs might want to um, be supported in. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are examples of the kinds of uh, technology resources that uh, Brian and Paolo are especially, um, uh, bring us special talents uh, to, to the consulting work they will do and, and, and we will fund their work with us on that. And then we also um, have been in discussions with uh, MIT App Inventor. Uh, right now, there are a couple of educators in California who are considered master teachers for the App Inventor. Um, and there are resources that anyone can use that are online um, to, to have uh, young people develop apps for social good. Um, for, for me personally, I think uh, it would be really hard for me to jump in and, and uh, create an app. And so what we want to offer is, again, for those in the learning community, if that's something that they want to do, we can try to uh, bring our colleagues in and develop some additional supports that would make it easier for App Inventor to be taken up as part of the after-school coding effort. And I know in Hong Kong, they're working on curriculum and resources for grades four through eight for App Inventor that might have some relevance in California. Um, this next slide is my colleague, Anmay. Are you back yet? I am here. I'm Great, here. I'll turn it to Thank you. you. Great. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, discuss a few of the resources we have at CS for All. And I think Stephanie described earlier that CS for All is really a movement to ensure that um, all K through 12 students have access to computer science education. And one of the ways we do that is by supporting local change. So, um, you know, uh, assuming you all are going to get a copy of this uh, of this presentation, you'll you'll be able to click through some of the links to get more in depth. But essentially, script 
is a set of resources that helps uh, school systems and LEAs um, come, to, uh, come up with a strategic plan for how they're going to do that. We are working on um, uh, getting resources to develop the script for the out-of-school time efforts, too, that will hopefully complement what's happening during the school day. Um, the CS Visions aspect of this is actually a research project that's being done specifically around um, the practice aspect of being say like you know coding it's more than just coding you know this is about learning how to um, you know um, uh, digital skills that will enable you to make to solve problems um, whether it be um, uh, in the tech sector or in civic engagement or workforce development um, that type of piece so it's an interesting thing used to look at when you think about how it's going to affect your community and then we have um, office hours as well as um, uh, the supporting NYC CS for all which is where the CS for all um, uh, initiative came out of next slide uh, we also are focused on um, rigor and equity understanding that in order to um, uh, ensure that all um, young people have access to this, we really have to think through exactly what that means for hard to reach populations. And some of the ways that we do that are um, by um, uh, pledges, um, as well in terms of different communities supporting how they're going to um, ensure that all kids have access to it. Um, the um, out of school time um, effort that we've just begun um, and and this is really focused on how does the opportunity in the out of school time that allows for flexibility and creativity and more opportunities for hands on learning how will that um, complement the efforts about what's happening um, in the in the uh, the school space as well. Uh, and then, as I said, you can click through some of these when you get the slide. There's a lot of information here, but um, but I want to make sure that we have time for questions for for George, which is really the heart of this this uh, um, uh, this webinar. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the one piece that I want to point out to you here is that the CS for All Summit. Um, this will be the third year that it's happening, and um, it will be in Salt Lake City. Uh, in um, on October 21st to 23rd and this year um, for anybody who has attended before um, it's going to not just be about pledges but they're going to be um, sessions that will um, delve into different aspects of CS for All and we're going to do a track on the after school OST time too as well which is great and then um, again these are all the different ways that you can engage with the community um, and communicate not just with us but with with others um, too as well who are working on this across the country so that that's my piece great okay so we're gonna take um questions and answers so please if anything has raised a question for you please put it in the uh, uh, chat room for us. We have a few minutes here if anyone has a question. Hey George, I have a question. Um, with your with your um, with your chill out unit. What were the age groups that you were working with the students on the refrigerator code? Uh, my students that I'm working with now are seventh and eighth graders. Not sure what age that is. Was it about 14, tw okay. thir 12, 13, 14? Um, and they're they're learning the code and they're they're able to do it. I work with uh, some younger kids, and I'll see if I can get them to do some code. I'm planning to do the chill out lesson with some like sixth graders and see where they go. How early do you start coding with the students in your after school program? Five, maybe four five and a half or five. Do you, do you start with Scratch Junior? Uh, well, actually, we start with some games, and we start with this robot from Wonder Workshop. Uh, what is he called? Dash and Dot. Uh, my my wife tends to work with the younger kids. She's created a bunch of lessons for like five and six year olds, 
Uh, I start in with things like scratch, uh, seven, eight years old nine or so we're doing MIT App Inventor. We're probably doing Arduino around nine or 10. Um, but if I get a kid that hasn't done code and they're 12, we go back and do Scratch. You start with Scratch, okay. I like to use Scratch and I like to use App Inventor. And then I move to Arduino. Now, now you, you are a robot doctor. So I know that you do uh, VEX robots? Yeah, so um, we do mostly robotics here. We do VEX robots. Uh, we do something called VEX IQ, which is kind of a plastic version of the VEX robots. Uh, we start kids on, you know, any kind of small robot that we can do. So we do a bunch of, we do Lego robots. Uh, recently, I just did some battle bots. I don't know if I ever want to do it again. But, uh, and my teams have done very well in robotics. So that's what prompted me to go for looking for other things for them to do for invention. So like the, the team that we put together for the first JV invent team and that are now the invent team were... I think in their sophomore year, they had already like won world championships in robotics. And so they were done and we needed to look for other things for them to do. And this was a, a nice thing to, for them to stretch with. Okay. Now, George, remember when we were preparing for this, um, 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 I think I mentioned to you that uh, we needed to make sure people know that they don't have to have a degree in electrical engineering uh, to be able to work with kids with coding. And Rosa has a question, uh, one, one of our attendees, and she asks, do you have a CS degree? And she states that she feels a little intimidated uh, to venture into this world. Can you, can you help Rosa feel more comfortable about, yes, she can do this? Yeah, so um, actually, I, I don't have a CS degree. I'm more of a electrical engineer, mechanical engineer. Um, but the, the first thing we start with is a basic LED circuit, a little tiny LED and a battery, and it lights up. And when the kid's able to do that and make it light up, you see the kid's eyes light up. And, and, and that's the beginning. And it's I can draw that little circuit for you. It's, you can find it online. It's, it's really easy. And then the Arduino, what I tried to show with the Arduino and the uh, Scratch, uh, although that Scratch, if you don't know it, it, it looks kind of weird. It was just a bunch of orange and blue things, but it's, it's ultra, ultra easy. It's, it's pulled over from a pallet where there are, there's a pallet of code for you to just yeah. pull over and use and you just pull it over and try it. And you will be surprised if you take a weekend to learn scratch yourself and you give it to your students, they'll start finding things that you didn't think of yeah. and they'll start just running on their own because it's that easy. Uh, and pretty soon the Arduino gets to be like that too. Sure. It's a little scary. There's a lot of brackets and squiggly lines and slashes and stuff, but it'll get that way pretty, pretty quickly to where they can do stuff on there. Yeah, and Rosa, just to let you know, um, I'm kind of intimidated by this stuff too. Uh, that's why we have George and, and some of our other awesome Invent Team educators uh, uh, to help explain this to you. Um, but I've been working with third, fourth, and fifth grade girls at a local elementary school here in Cambridge, and I have learned scratch. So if I can learn it, Anyone can learn it, and it's really a whole lot of fun. So I encourage you, uh, you know, to go online, um, check it out. Uh, Scratch is free. Uh, play around with it. And, and I think some of the, uh, the, uh, the best comments I've had um, have not been from the little girls in this after-school program, but from some of the other mentors. I, I, I heard one adult mentor say, hey, that's not too bad. I can do that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really encourage you, uh, don't be intimidated, go to Scratch, check it out, and uh, have fun. Do we have any other questions? Um, I see that we have Bob Richards, I believe, on, as an attendee. Bob, are you there? 
Okay, so so Bob, I've just been told you're not able to talk, so I'll ask you a question. Uh, oh, okay. Wait a minute. We're going to give you permission to talk. So um, Bob Richards is uh, one of our Invent Team teachers. He's from rural Michigan, and I know that we have. Um, uh, Malaya also is an attendee who is from rural California. And um, one thing we've learned is that all kids can invent. And I think what I'm seeing from, from, from George and, and also from, from Bob is that all kids can code. Um, but we have to give them these opportunities to learn. Um, uh, so, so Bob, I know that uh, that you've worked with the kids there in in Stockbridge. Um, how how early do you start working with the kids coding in Stockbridge? Uh, can you hear me? Oh, I can. How are you? Good, good. Um, I personally start with seventh graders. Um, I have seventh and eighth graders in a STEM class that we use the JV Invent teams, uh, but I know my colleague uh, Josh Nichols and and Lori Zemke start coding um, as early as third grade. They're great. Do they use Scratch also? Do you know? We yes, we we all start with Scratch. We all start with Scratch. Isn't that interesting? So um, Malaya says hi from rural Northern California. Um, you know. There might be an opportunity, Bob, for you to talk directly with Malaya uh, as we work forward with uh, um, uh, coding with JV Invent teams um, it, in rural. Um, I, I think George has got us covered there in, in, in Southern California, I, I'm hopeful. Um, and uh, Malaya says she hopes to see you soon. So, uh, oh, there's Malaya, very good. Bye. <laughs> we see your face. Uh, do we have any other questions or? Oh, I see one. Uh, so um, we have, does coding drive the CS skills needed or do CS skills drive the coding when using the JV Invent Team curricula? Trying to find out the balance of how much time to spend, especially with out of school time. So what drives what, George? Do you have an opinion on this? this? You know, going back to what I said about we're trying to give them tools of invention, I think whatever the subject of the thing they're working on that day uh, drives things. So that, that's why I spent a lot of time with the temperature sensor. Mm. It, it just was a problem to read a thermometer and write it down constantly. And so then the kids were looking for a better way to do it. And so that's what we did. Um, I, I usually like problems to drive what we teach. I don't know if I answered the right question, but that's been my experience. Well, certainly we've seen with Invent Teams um, that when kids have a good problem to solve, then they're willing to invest the time it takes to learn the skills necessary to solve the problem. But sometimes um, when you're just teaching skills without context, then it can feel a whole lot like school and not very fun. I, I wanna chime in here on some of what I've observed in visiting. Um, we we've used these guides in one week camps. And uh, for example, with the chill out guide, uh, typically the students would team up and some teams do this magnificent unexpected work around the design and the look of their lunchbox. Others have really gotten into the technological aspects and done some amazing things on the technical sides, uh, including for some how that lunchbox opens and closes. Um, and I think really what you see when you look at them is a wide variety of approaches among the students. 
And I think it is a great example uh, of the opportunity, the teaching moments, the opportunities for reflection of the different strengths that all kids bring to the work and modeling how they can learn from each other. So there's, there's a lot that can go into this that is that has lessons that go beyond are you a good coder have you got the code right and i think that's the the power that is going to come from bringing it together and there may be kids who are going to excel at the coding piece that can can teach that piece others who you know we had these two young women who did the most phenomenal work totally at an express expected braiding felt for the handle of the lunchbox and the, the the rest of the design of it was spectacular so it's an opportunity to value all the strengths in the room while they're all learning to code I think we picked up on all of the questions that have come in. Um, you have our contact information. Uh, these resources are free and on our website. Um, we'll be making the webinar available. George, I want to thank you. This was incredible. And on May as well, I want to thank you for being such a good partner. Um, Linda Kakelis, thank you for the great uh, publication on how we can think about parent engagement and culturally cultural relevance. Um, and um, with that, I I've got I've got one great question here. Okay, all right, Lee. Okay. This one's for George. George, what's a good starting budget to build a pile of junk? <laughs> Wait a second, George, you're muted. I was muted. Um, some of it is free. Find junk around the home or even have your recycle bin. Old cardboard boxes are very good to have. Uh, if you have a little money, instead of using cardboard boxes, we use foam core. It's kind of the next step up. Um, electronics, I think kind of the best source is to buy some of these kits. Just search Amazon. And I showed there like one $35 kit. If you have enough money, you can buy those for each group of student and you'll have everything you need to work with Arduino. When you uh, say a group, how big is the group, the George? Boards. Yes. I'm sorry, I interrupted. How, how big is the group you're speaking of? With three or four kids? Probably four kids is okay. I wouldn't go much more with that on a single Arduino board. And I never go less than two. Some people think they need to work as individuals, but I much prefer two heads working on one project. Agreed. Okay. What, um, so I, I don't know if I really answered the question. I think you can do a lot with a hundred bucks and you know, you, of course, more money, you can do more and you can, you can get pretty far for free too. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's see, one more question, I think. Uh, th this is from Linda. Thanks, everyone, for the great info question. Any insights or lessons learned in sharing resources and info with the families of the students to help them support their children in CS? What a great question. George, what is the interaction you have with families? Uh, I... It's it's mixed in the different places I I work. Uh, my main location, uh, I interact with parents almost every day when they pick up kids. It's uh, it's after school program. Yeah. And some of them are technical, so we can talk about code and circuits and things. Uh, others are not, and it's just happy to see their kid leaving with a smile at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, I. I don't have like formal reviews with the parents or quizzes that I send home so they can see what their kid is doing. It's all kind of end result driven the way, the way I work, but it's very helpful to have supportive parents, which, which we do here. Great. Hey, Bob, do you have anything to add about in, uh, parent engagement?
Good. Can so, you hear me now? Yes, thank you, Bob. Yes. Um, I do a couple things. One is through social media. Uh, we share the students' projects uh, on, on our Facebook page and on Twitter. And then also we've been using a platform called Crossbraining, which allows the students to share a 45-second video of their completed project and the work that they've done on that with their parents and uh, with team members. Super cross-braining? Yes. Okay, we'll, we'll add that to, to some of our resources. Um, it, how, how do you all recruit students to form a group? And, and George, do you charge it? it is, is your after school a fee-based um, after school program? Yeah, most of it is a fee-based program. Uh, also, I'm new to running kind of a maker space. So we have a membership by donation program where we, you know, basically provide space for kids to work on their science projects and things. Uh, That's interesting. Now, have, have, have you thought about doing any type of a, a, like a mini maker fair? Uh, the, possibly, yeah. So I, when in when that was mentioned here, I was thinking of some of the things we do. We tend to seek out various little competitions to do, like uh, frequently uh, little bits, which, by the way, is a oh, great yeah. uh, toy or product to to learn electronics. Frequently, they'll do things where you post a little YouTube video and everybody shares their little ideas online. So it's kind of like an online maker fair. Um, we run open houses and uh, like when we had our review meeting for the invent team, we also had our sixth graders here showing off their stuff and the younger kids, uh, you know, showing off their stuff in kind of in coordination with the high school invent team. Great. Now going back to little bits, is that, is that um, through spark fun? No. Um, oh, do you, in case people don't know what Little Bits is, uh, it's, uh, Lee, do you know Little Bits? Or, yeah, they're, yeah, they're out of the UK, right? No, no, no. It's, no, uh, it I was invented by a woman from the Media Lab, Aya Badir. Oh. Okay. And uh, it is called the Lego of Electronics. Oh. And essentially what she did is created a platform of things like switches, batteries, sensors, LEDs that all snap together magnetically. Oh, okay. And it's, uh, kids can build circuits literally in seconds. We, we gotcha. show them that you have this bit that turns things on and this bit that's an output and we put them in front of them and the kindergartners, first graders, second graders are building circuits. Oh, okay. And little, little bits that you can yeah. look at. Well, he has actually offered us a, a yeah. There's a link, a, a hyperlink there. So thanks, Malia. So, well, this has been fun this afternoon. Um, well, sure. Um, so, so Stephanie's asked me to share uh, with the group how we do. Um, the end of camp celebrations uh, for JV Invent teams, uh, where we actually set up a small showcase of uh, the work that the students have done, uh, and, and not just the, the finished product, but the, uh, the iterative products, uh, the, the things that have been in process throughout the week. Uh, we invite um, parents, of course, and, and and other people um, from uh, the community to come in and, and walk through and ask questions. Um, sometimes we have refreshments. Other times we just have the the excited kids who want to share their 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 work, uh, and, and that's I think been very very engaging. And then of course uh, we offer um, certificates uh, uh, certificates uh, for for. Uh, creative and inventive uh, activities throughout the week and, and not specific to uh, just uh, one winning team, um, but, but celebrating all the kids for uh, what they put into um, a, a week-long camp or, or 
uh, in the case of JV after school, that tends to be like an eight week um, after school activity. Uh, so, so that's not really like a, a, a a maker fair Malaya, but it's a, it's a celebration of the inventive spirit. And uh, that's worked well for us. So with that, it is 3.59. I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon, uh, taking the time to, uh, to, to share. We've, I think I've learned from, from George, and I always learn from Bob and Malaya. Thank you for your sharing. Folks, uh, uh, program development team, thanks for your great questions. Rosa, keep up the scratch. Um, may, maybe we'll have a scratch competition, you and me, one of these days. Um, but thanks much, and, and stay in touch, everyone. Take care.